thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us a space that we can come together um, and worship you and learn about you, even though it's our untraditional setting. Uh, thank you for all of the students, even though we're in different places right now. I pray that you would just watch over all of them. Uh, let them feel connected to each other and to you during this time. God, I pray that you watch over Matt with a sermon today about prayer in untraditional families. Uh, that they still pray for each other. Uh, I know not everybody's family situation looks the same, but it's important to know that you've got people within that family praying for you as well. So I pray that you would help us be able to take the knowledge of the day that we can pray for others in our family better. Thank you so much, God. It is time for Wake Online, and I'm super excited because we have Maddie Miller doing worship for us, and we're starting our week two of Atypical. So last week, we talked about how not-so-typical families are often used by God. So let's talk about families. Uh, I put a poll out, actually I put four polls out on Twitter this week and asked how many parents you have, how many siblings you have, how many pets you have, and how often you get in fights with <laughs> with your family. And the results are actually kind of crazy. Like we had, um, how many parents? We have 80% of our kids that answered this had two parents at home, but 13 of you, 13% of you said that you have more than one or more than three, I'm sorry. And 7% of you said you only have one at home. Um, when it comes to siblings, most of us have two siblings. Uh, when it comes to pets, literally everyone but like Maddie has cat or dogs, right? Um, I sadly had to answer, no, I don't. My family is incomplete. Everything is sad. And then you talk about when's the last time you got into a fight or a disagreement with a family member. And actually yesterday, last week, and literally right now are all tied at 33% uh, with 16 votes. So that's kind of funny. Um, but we talked about different kinds of families, and all of you have different kinds of families. So, here are some more. You have a foster family where kids are kind of coming in because they need you and coming out because their parents have finally gotten stuff together. Or a blended family where, like, my family is a blended family. I have a stepbrother named Christian and a stepmother named Kathy. Um, a single parent family, uh, that's when, like, you have just your mom at home. Uh, raising you, you have the independent kid family. Okay, that's the that's the the, the thing that uh, when when you get home from school, you kind of make your own dinner, uh, or you take the dog out, or uh, parents are pretty much married to their jobs. That's a family that's becoming super prevalent in America today. And then, last but not least, you have the friend family, and you'll you'll get like that where your friends are closer than your family, probably in high school and definitely in college. When you move out from your family and in with like your roommates, they become like family. Like for me, my family, uh, yeah, I have my sister and uh, my my stepbrother and my dad and mom and stepmom and uh, all of that, but I also. I count my best friend Parker, I, I count my best friend Adam as my family because I've been with them my whole life and they've loved me through everything I've done. And as the amazing and wise Mr. Feeney once said, you don't need to be blood to be family. And no matter what kind of family you are, your family is loved by God. And your atypical family could be even more atypical than it is now. So when it comes to our families, who says what typical really is? Sometimes we let others' definitions or views of what's normal shape our view of our own families. But like we said last week, no matter what kind of family you come from, no family is normal. Your family is already atypical, but what if God is calling your family to be even more atypical than it already is? 
See, every family has imperfections, problems, pains, fights, struggles, but your typical family, they either try to handle them on their own or never at all. And atypical families, on the other hand, invite God into their imperfections, problems, and struggles. See, last week, we said there is no family too simple or too complex for God to use. And your family can be used by God to do atypical things in the world. But how? So a lot of you guys know that a couple years ago on October 7th, Emily fell in our garage and broke her ankle, okay? This was a devastating event for our family because we were scared to death. Emily had been told that uh, because of her disorder, if she ever broke something down there, she may never walk again. Uh, so a lot of prayer went into this recovery, and actually four awesome things came out of this, and just through our prayers, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay them out for you and just tell you the story real fast. One, we moved in with her parents for like three weeks, okay? Uh, just to take care of her. She had to have surgery. She's got plates and pins in her ankle now. Um, and the, the, one th the first thing that happened is I got really close with my in-laws. You know, typically when you get married to someone's daughter, they don't like you very much for taking their daughter. Well, that's never been the case for me, but it's always been something that society deems as normal. But when I moved into their house and I got to see how they love and care for their daughter, how they love and care for my wife, we became much closer, okay? The second thing is Emily can walk, okay? Um, that whole thing we were scared about didn't happen. God heard our prayers every night and heard her parents' prayers every night and our, our sister-in-law and our brother-in-law, Kenny, and their prayers every night. And he worked. And the third thing is I got closer to my wife. I had to start uh, kind of helping her more and more and more. And in that, we became very, very close, even closer than we thought we could get. And for that, I thank God. And now it might be weird to say like, thank God for Emily breaking her ankle, but it was something that really shaped our marriage. We watched a whole TV show because we couldn't do anything else. And that was a thing we looked forward to every night, praying that she would be okay, praying this one question, God, what good is going to come out of this? And I've already shown you three things that were good, but here's the fourth one and probably the biggest one for me. In the midst of praying, God, what good came out of this? What are you teaching me? Emily was watching these two little kids every day throughout the week. And when she broke her ankle, she could no longer babysit those kids. So I got called up to the big leagues and I stepped in and I watched the kids. And through that relationship for the next two or three months, I really got to know that family. Um, and this is a family that Emily grew up with. So she, she knew them really well. However, I did not. And I got to work, uh, work with them and love on their kids and just be there for them. And eventually God used me to get a better relationship with the father of that family. And on Christmas Eve of that year, I got to baptize him. And that is God answering prayers. You know, when we pray, God, what good can come of this? He's like, hey, I'm going to make sure she's still walking. Hey, I'm going to make your relationship with your in-laws amazing. Hey, I'm going to make your relationship with your wife, though stressful at times, I'm going to make it amazing. And fourth, I am going to use you to bring someone into my family someone that I've been searching for and running after for years. That's the power of prayer. And that's why it's important for families to pray together, even when things are broken and when things are messed up and when relationships are strained. That's why we pray for each other. And we're going to look a little bit more of that later today when we look at another family. But for right now, I just want you to think about that. When something bad is happening in your life, do you just say, God, what are you doing? Or do you say, God, show me how you're working through this? And then let them work through you. See, I would never say a couple years ago that Emily breaking her ankle was an amazing thing that helped our family. But now looking back on it, it is. Our family is stronger because something bad happened. And we prayed through it. Another family has a, a godly man at the center of it now because we prayed through it. Through something bad that was happening with us. God works through your prayers. See, at some point, every family experiences difficulty or conflict. And you might be experiencing one of those situations right now. You're stuck at home with them, so you might be. Typical families might try and handle those situations on their own, like we said before, or ignore the problems and hope they go away. But atypical families chasing after God know that they, can they can't handle them on their own. 
and atypical families ask for God's help. And we're going to see that in chapter 13 of Genesis here in a little bit. So last week, we met the family, okay? We met the first family, the world's first family, Adam and Eve. And we saw how their story went very wrong as a result of their choices to disobey God and hurt each other. But because God is a God of grace, God used their family to do something amazing, to one day bring Jesus into the world. And today I want to introduce you to another family. This family lived many generations after Adam and Eve, and they were atypical in their own way. So in Genesis chapter 13, we're going to talk about Abraham, actually Abram. Okay, you may have heard of him before. He's an important person in the history of our faith because an important promise God made to him uh, made him important. <laughs> Let's learn more about Abraham's life, um, specifically his relationship with his nephew, Lot. We're going to start in Genesis 13, 1 through 13. So Abram left Egypt and traveled north into the Negev, along with his wife and Lot and all that they owned. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. From the Negev, they continued traveling by stages toward Bethel, and they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. This was the same place where Abram had built the altar, and there he worshipped the Lord again. Lot, who was traveling with Abram, had also become very wealthy with flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle, and many tents. But the land could not support both Abram and Lot with all their flocks and herds living so close together. So disputes and fights broke out between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot, and at that time the Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. Finally, Abram said to Lot, well, let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we're close relatives. The whole countryside is open for you. Take your choice of any section of land you want, and we'll separate. If you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land to the right. And if you prefer the land to the right, then I'll go to the left. Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zor. And the whole area was well watered and beautiful, like the garden of the Lord or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. And he went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. See, Abraham and Lot were like many of our families today. They fought. In fact, they fought so much that if they had continued living near each other, they probably would have hated each other. Okay, So Abram and Lot, moved to completely different cities. And we'll get back to Lot in a second, but let me tell you a little bit about Abraham so you can understand how atypical or not normal his family really was. And this is in Genesis 18, 1 through 15. The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your long journey. All right, they said, do, if you, do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, hurry. Get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, and bake some bread. And then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf and gave it to his servant, who quickly prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat, and he served it to the men. Weird meal, but okay. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where's your wife, Sarah? The visitors asked. Oh, she's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Well, then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, she's going to have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent, and Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself 
and said, how could a worn out woman, yikes, like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is so old. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman have a me, like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, you did laugh. See, Abraham and Sarah were super old, okay? They didn't have any kids, but they were visited by messengers from God who told them Sarah was going to have a baby. Imagine this, your great-grandma rocking in her little rocking chair, telling you God sent her messengers to say she's going to have a baby. You'd probably be a little concerned about grandma's mental health, right? That's how atypical Abram's family was. Okay, now back to Abraham and Lot. This is in Genesis as well. Um, remember, Lot is living far away. Abraham is here. When the men got up to leave, they set off for Sodom, where Lot lives. Abraham walked with them to say goodbye. And then God said, shall I keep back from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham is, about, is going to become a large and strong nation. and All the nations of the world are going to find themselves blessed through him. Yes, I've set it on him as the one to train his children and future family to observe God's way of life. Live kindly and generously and fairly so that God can complete in Abraham what he's promised him. And God continued, The cries of the victims in Sodom and Gomorrah are deafening. The sin of those cities is immense. I'm going down to see for myself. I'm going to see if what they're doing is as bad as it sounds, and then I'll know. So the men set out for Sodom, but Abraham stood in God's path, blocking his way, because Lot lives there. Abraham confronted him, are you serious? You're planning on getting rid of the good people right along with the bad? What if there are 50 decent people left in the city? Will you lump the good with the bad and get rid of the Lot? And wouldn't you spare the city for the sake of those 50 innocents? I can't believe you would do that. You'd kill off the good and the bad alike as if there were no difference between them. Doesn't the judge of all earth judge with any justice? And God said, if I find 50 decent people in Sodom, I'll spare the place just for them. Abraham came back. He said, do I, a mere mortal made of, from a handful of dirt, dare open my mouth again to my master? Yes. What if the 50 fall short by five? Would you destroy the city because of those missing five? And he said, I won't destroy it if there are 45. So again, Abraham spoke up and he said, what if you only find 40? Neither will I destroy it if I find 40. So he said, Master, don't be irritated with me, but like, what if only 30 are found? No, I won't do it if I find 30. He pushed on. I know I'm trying your patience, Lord, but how about 20? See, he's trying to protect his family. And God says, I won't destroy it for 20. He wouldn't quit, though. He says, don't get angry, Master. This is the last time. What if you can only come up with 10? No, for the sake of only 10, I won't destroy the city. So when God finished talking with Abraham, he left. And Abraham went home. And the story continues here in, in chapter 19, 27 through 29. Abraham got up early the next morning and went to the place he had so recently stood with God. He looked out over Sodom and Gomorrah, surveying the whole plain, and all he could see was smoke belching from the earth, like smoke from a furnace. And that's the story. When, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he was mindful of Abraham and first got Lot out of there before he blasted those cities off the face of the earth. See, Abraham and Lot had a long history of fighting, a long history of disagreements. Remember, they fought so much that they had to move to different cities. But when Abraham learned God was going to destroy Sodom, the city where Lot lived, Abraham made a choice. He pleaded with God on Lot's behalf. And in response to Abraham's prayer, Lot and his family were saved. Last week, we said that if you want God to use your family to do atypical things, sometimes you have to be the first person in your family to do something atypical. Remember I said it might start with you. Well, that's what Abraham did. 
When you're fighting with someone in your family, it isn't typical to do what Abraham did. The typical response is to fight back, hold a grudge, or give the silent treatment. Uh, but Abraham chose to do the atypical thing. He prayed for Lot in the middle of their conflict. He didn't wait for an apology from him. He reached out first through prayer. He said, God, what if you find five people there that are good? Will you take them out? And he said, yes. See, this might seem so simple, but it's atypical. See, not so typical families pray for each other. You know, when, when Emily broke her ankle, we prayed for each other. And more than Emily being able to walk and be fine, someone else was brought into the kingdom of God. And just like Abraham saw prayer change his family for the better, and I saw prayer change my family and their family for the better, prayer can change your family for the better too. Every family has imperfections. Every family has problems and struggles, but atypical families invite God into those situations through prayer. And prayer doesn't have to be complicated, okay? It can be as simple as thanking God for your family, even if you're not sure you mean it at the moment. Uh, it can be as simple as asking God to give you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, oh, just like this Proofs of the Spirit song. Asking God to give you wisdom to resolve a disagreement or asking God to do the same for the family member you're fighting with. It can be as simple as thanking God for helping your family or as, uh, you know, thanking him for helping you. Think right now about a recent disagreement or fight you had with a family member or one you seem to have often. Mine revolve around dishes. Now imagine how that conflict can be transformed if you stopped to pray instead of fight. How do you think prayer could change your attitude, your temper, or your view of it, your perspective? How do you think prayer could change the person you're fighting with? And how do you think prayer could begin to change your family's pattern of behavior for the long term? See, it's interesting that Abraham chose to pray for Lot before they ever reconciled. In the middle of their conflict, when they said, you live over there, I live over there, Abraham went first by choosing to pray for Lot, to intercede in front of God for Lot instead of continuing to fight. So this week, what if you decided to go first? When disagreements happen, typical families scream, fight, hold grudges, and struggle to find common ground, but not so typical as chasing after God, pray for each other. If you commit to praying for your family more than you fight with them, imagine how God might be able to use your family to do atypical things in this world. See, we have the ability to pray for our family and to see God move in our families and to see God move in the world through our families because of Jesus. Because of his son who came down to glorify God and to die on the cross for our sins and to resurrect three days later. See, we have the ability to love our families because he loved us first. So whatever you have for communion, take that as Maddie leads us in worship. And remember, God can use your family to do atypical things in this world and atypical families pray for each other.